continue in our expositions through the Gospel of Mark this morning. We're at this paragraph in Mark 14, verse 27. Remember where Jesus and the disciples are, where we've seen this in recent weeks. They are assembled in the upper room. They have been partaking of the Passover and the Lord Jesus has instituted at the end of that the Lord's Supper. We read in verse 27, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said, likewise. Well, let's ask God to help us as we come now to this part of his word. We need his aid. Let's seek him just briefly in a moment of prayer. Let's pray together. Our gracious and loving Father, we come before you as your children. We come before you as people who uh, desire to know your word, who desire to know your will for our lives. And we are so grateful to you, Father, that you have given to us, you have revealed your will to us in your holy scriptures. And we pray now as we come to this this small part of your Bible that you would open our eyes, that we might behold wonderful things here. We pray that, Lord, as we consider your truths, that you would speak to our hearts. We ask, Father, that you would indeed be amongst us by your Spirit, ministering to each one where we are at, and accomplishing your purpose as your word goes forth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, do you love reading biographies? I do. How long has it been since you read a Christian biography? If it's been a while, then we would want to encourage you to take a little walk, maybe about 20 paces. Sure, we could all handle that. Down that corridor, turn right at the end, find the church library and borrow a good Christian biography. There's certainly something inspiring in reading accounts of lives of people who were fully devoted to the Lord. So we read surprising and maybe radical conversions that sometimes moves us to pray more believingly for others. We read of records of deep spiritual experience. It it, it makes us long for for such transformation in our cooling hearts. Or we read of descriptions of, of great missionary achievements. That tends to broaden our vision and fill us with spiritual energy and drive to do a little thing, as it were, in our world for the Lord. Good Christian biographies are extremely helpful. But not all biographies are helpful because some make us more depressed than inspired. And they're the ones... Because of the way they've been written, they they, they make it out as if the subject of that particular biography is some great superman or superwoman. They they present their character, they present the person as someone who, who, who never fears, who never falters, who never fails. Well, such stories are not realistic. And in the end, when we read them, we feel more and more inadequate and discouraged. So don't read bad biographies, but read good biography. What what we want, what we need is a portrait of discipleship which will at the same time be inspiring but still realistic. We must be able as we read those stories to to feel that those people we're reading about are, are human beings like us. And in that way we need to see that they were people with with real weaknesses like 
We are. Well, when we open up the New Testament Gospels, we find realistic accounts of disciples, don't we? We see that the disciples were ordinary men and at times we get glimpses of their faithfulness and loyalty. At times we, 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 we see them as honest men. We saw that a couple of weeks ago in, in the upper room where, where, where they all say, Lord, is it I? It was a moment of honesty. But then there are the occasions when they are presented as real men with failures and real weaknesses. And yet as we trace the lives of those men, as we move past the Gospels, we read through the, the New Testament, we get into the book of, of Acts in particular, we see what, what marvellous transformation the grace of God can bring when ordinary people, ordinary, otherwise weak men, when they are filled with the power of the Spirit. There can be an incredible transformation. Well, in the passage that's before us this morning here in Mark's Gospel, we have a clear portrait of weakness. It's the weakness of Peter that stands out in this passage. But we actually see more than Peter's weakness. We also see the weakness of all the disciples in this passage. But I want to suggest to you we see more than that in this passage. These verses provide not just a portrait of their weakness, but this passage is a mirror. What happens when you look into a mirror? You see yourself. So in that sense, looking into this passage is a mirror. It shows us, it shows up our own weakness. So this morning we're considering what I've simply entitled a portrait of weakness. There are four main things that I want us to think about as we move through uh, these four verses. And the four things will be these. Precise prediction. They're all Ps. Precise prediction proud proclamation, personal prediction, and then lastly, prevalent presumption. Firstly then, the precise prediction. Again, remember where we are, what the context is when we come to this paragraph. Jesus and his disciples have finished celebrating the Passover feast. At the conclusion of that feast, Jesus has instituted the Lord's Supper where they have partaken of the Lord's Supper. They sing a hymn at the end of those proceedings. They leave the upper room. They make their way somewhere through the streets of Jerusalem late on the Thursday night. They pass through one of the city gates of Jerusalem they descend into the Kidron Valley, which was right outside the wall of Jerusalem. They cross the brook Kidron and they begin to ascend the Mount of Olives. Now all of that is parceled up very briefly in verse 26. And it says, and they went, when they had sung a hymn, they went out, out of the upper room, and they went out to the Mount of Olives. Remember where the Mount of Olives is. It's just opposite the city of Jerusalem. That's where they were seated when we're looking at chapter 13 and they're looking back at the temple and Jesus gave all that prophecy about the second coming and the, and the period between the first and second coming of Christ. So somewhere between leaving the upper room and entering what is, as we know in the next section of this passage in the chapter, is the Garden of Gethsemane located in the Mount of Olives Somewhere between leaving the upper room and arriving in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, we read in verse 27 what Jesus said. Then Jesus said to them, somewhere as they're walking, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus says, all of you, remember who's with him, all 11 of you. Remember, Judas is no longer there. He's gone to find the chief priests and so on to, to carry out his task. It's Jesus and the 11. All of you will stumble. Now that word stumble comes across to us there in the English. It, it comes from the Greek word which has the idea uh, used. It's the word used for a trap. More accurately, it comes from the root word for the stick which had the bait attached to it. So that when you're trying to trap, for instance, an animal, when an animal would come and, and, and it would take the bait, it would trigger the stick. And then because the trick had been, uh, uh, the, the stick rather, had been triggered, then the animal would be trapped. 
The animal would be ensnared. And that's the idea. It would be caused to stumble. It would be caught. And that's what Jesus announces here. Jesus announces this prediction that all 11 would soon be ensnared. They would be caused to stumble. And Jesus makes it very plain that this stumbling will occur because of him. That's what he says, isn't it? All of you will be made to stumble because of me. What is about to happen, what I am predicting is about to happen, is going to happen because of me. You'll be caught in a season of defection, a lapse in your loyalty and professed attachment to me will come because of me. Now what's the connection between Jesus and their defection? Well it's interesting when Jesus explains this, he says the reason why he said this. The end of verse 27 he says, for, here's the reason why I just said that, for it is written. And Jesus explains then what this is in relation to an Old Testament prophecy. What's going to unfold is actually a fulfilment of what one of the prophets had said hundreds of years previously. And that's the quote, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That comes from the book of Zechariah. So if you would like to find the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament, toward the back there in the midst of all those minor prophets, it's actually the second last book of the Old Testament, so we haven't got to turn too far back. Zechariah chapter 13, that's from where Jesus makes this quote. Zechariah 13, notice verse 1, it says, in that day, in a day to come, in that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. This is, so the prophet Zechariah speaking God's word saying there's going to come a day. It's Messiah's day, we would understand that. There's going to come a day in which he will open the fountain for sin. He will open the fountain for uncleanness. There will be a washing away of sin. Well, how will this happen? How will this redemption, how will this cleansing from sin occur? Verse 7, he goes on to say, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts, Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. Jehovah will awaken his sword. That's what he's saying. Wake up, sword. Jehovah is going to awaken his sword. And notice what it says. Against who in the first part of verse 7? Against my shepherd. Against the man who is my fellow. The man who is my equal. That This other expression is the one who is close to me. Capital M, the man, or capital C, the, the companion. Jehovah is calling for the smiting of his fellow, his companion, the shepherd of the sheep. So that's a reference to Jesus, the Messiah. And when Jehovah strikes the shepherd, so he was being said here, Jehovah is going to strike Jesus. That's exactly what Isaiah says happened. In Isaiah 53, in verse 4, where it says, We esteemed him smitten, stricken by God and afflicted. God did it. When Jehovah God strikes the shepherd, then what will happen? That's the quote that Jesus makes. When, when, when he is struck, what happens? The sheep will be scattered. The sheep will, will temporarily fall prey to confusion, to cowardice, to, to the fear of men, and they'll be scattered. And then you can understand why the analogy is used of the shepherd and the sheep. And the shepherd's gone, the protector's gone, and there's fear. Where do the sheep go? They, they scatter. We come back to Mark's Gospel. We come back to the very passage itself we're looking at. We see that Jesus' prediction is not only that. That seems very negative. It is that. But Jesus' prediction also has an, an optimistic climax. He goes on to say there in verse 28, But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Hear what he says. I will be raised up. 
Jehovah who smites him will vindicate him by rise, raising him from the dead. And there's something here about Jesus the shepherd and the eleven, the sheep, at the end of verse 28, and he says, I will go before you to Galilee. You'll go to Galilee, but I'm going to go before you. So after I have been raised up, you will come together once more. You'll be gathering to me. Your scattering that's going to happen is only temporary. See, it's optimistic. So though you will defect from me, I will not defect from you. I will actually go before you as the shepherd and you will be gathered again as sheep to me. In my resurrected body, I will go ahead of you. And that's exactly what is repeated a couple of days after Jesus says this on the resurrection morning. If you go over to chapter 16 in Mark, that's the very thing that Jesus just said there is referred to here by the angel. So Jesus is risen from the dead, Mark 16 verse 6, but he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So here they are in chapter 14. They're making their way somewhere between the upper room on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus gives this precise prediction. Firstly, it's a startling announcement about Jehovah striking Jesus and then that leading to the abandonment of him by the eleven but still Jesus gives this hope that Jehovah will raise up Jesus implying that he's going to be struck so much he will die. But after that, yes, he will come back from the dead and he will gather you together to him in Galilee. Remember where Galilee was. It was the place where these 11 were actually originally called by Jesus. Judas was the only one, from far as we understand, from Judah. Loving touch, isn't it? We see from Jesus even in that detail. So firstly then, the precise prediction. Secondly, think with me as we move through the passage to the second thing, the proud proclamation. And we see here that Peter is in fine form as the Peter you get to know in the Gospels. This is such a, a realistic picture of the Peter that we've come to know through Mark's pen just alone. And it's a rather wonderful scene here in many ways because remember as we were beginning to study this book we, we talked about who Mark was, where did Mark get his information from. Mark wasn't one of the twelve. And the most common understanding is that Mark had this close connection with Peter, close friend of Peter. So Mark, as the Spirit provides him the information, most of it probably came directly from Peter. So here's Peter in a sense telling on himself years later through Mark. Well, what's he telling himself? The wonderful thing I think about Mark here, though he's a friend, a loyal friend, he, he's, he, he's not acting like the editor who doesn't want to put that in so he gets out the white out or he hits the delete button on his keyboard. He, he, he doesn't do that. Mark records Peter warts and all. We see what Peter does first here than anyone else. Peter blurts it out. He speaks first. He, he's impulsive. And we hear his words, and they're words of self-confidence. In verse 29, Peter said to him, Peter responds to Jesus, Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Even if all of them will, I won't. So here's Peter, he recognises the potential weakness in the ten. <laughs> he recognises that that will mean they could do it. But as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I'm strong. He had no difficulty, did he? No difficulty at all believing these words that Jesus said to be true about others. He didn't struggle with that. I mean, I can understand, Lord, that what you're saying here is about these men. They will be made to stumble, but 
not me. You see, Peter saw himself as an exception. In his thinking, the words of Jesus just simply didn't apply to him in his situation. Now I say to you, friends, this passage is like a mirror to all disciples of Christ at some time or another. All of us. We're just like that. How often when God's word comes clearly to us, like those were clear words from Jesus, when God's word comes clearly to us, words that we can understand, words that we do believe, perhaps the Lord calls for deeper devotion, he's calling us and we know he is, to a deeper commitment to Christ and a commitment to his body, to his church, and yet we start thinking just like Peter. I mean, that might be true for others. Greater commitment, sure, that's, that's right, that's good, but it just doesn't apply to me. I mean, I'm the exception to this. I mean, I believe it's true, and it's certainly right that other Christians should follow this biblical principle or this biblical practice, but just not me. Peter saw himself as the exception to what Jesus said, thinking what Jesus clearly said applied to others, but it didn't apply to him. Can you see yourself in that mirror? We often do the exact same thing. We see how it applies to others, but somehow we convince ourselves, well, due to my family situation, I mean, due to my husband, or due to my work conditions, or my upbringing, due to my hurt, I mean, I'm the exception. And we exempt ourselves from the application of God's word to our lives when all the while we can see that it clearly applies to somebody else. It's not only a portrait of weakness, it's a mirror to our own hearts. You remember the words Jesus said when he said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks? Well, I think those words of Jesus apply to this verse, verse 29. Peter's mouth reveals his heart at that point in time. Peter's heart at this point in time was full of confidence. Here is a man of self-confidence. He would never forsake Jesus. Never, never, never. I mean, I'm not weak like those others. Don't you realise, Lord, what I'm like? I'm strong. Self-confidence. Jesus had just clearly said, all of you, <laughs> all of you will be made to stumble, but Peter thinks, I'm not in that all, because I'm not weak, I'm strong. He's self-confident. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. There's much pride in Peter's heart at this point. Peter assumes an attitude almost of superiority over his fellow disciples. He had an inflated opinion of himself. It obviously wasn't the opinion Jesus had and his opinion's always right. You see, his words actually reveal that he didn't even know himself really. He hadn't yet realised the true state of his own heart at this point. His own heart was deceiving him when his heart was weak, he was being persuaded it was strong. In his own strength, he thought he would be able to stand. I'm the strong one. I will never be made to stumble. The proud proclamation. The third thing we notice as we move forward in the passage is the personal prediction. Because Jesus then comes back and responds personally to Peter. And the words of Jesus that come to us in verse 30 are words of great weight. And again, I draw your attention in verse 30 to the first word. Those of you who have been with us a number of times know now, hopefully, that when you see that word assuredly, that word verily, that word amen, 
You should have your ears twigged, as they should have. But when Jesus uses that word, it's, a, it's like alert. I'm about to say something of great importance, of great weight, a very serious matter. So what does he say? Assuredly, I say to you, speaking, speaking to Peter, that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. So rather than being the exceptional hero, you're going to be the exceptional coward, Peter. And Peter, this is going to happen to you sooner rather than later. Notice what Jesus says. He gives the time frame. And maybe the time frame in this language is a little confusing to us, but I believe we can easily understand it. When he says, I say to you that today, even this night... Remember, keep in mind the Jewish way of keeping calendar days and nights and dates. Their day commenced at sundown and it went right through for the next 24 hour period and that day then finished at the next sundown. So when he says today, he's thinking of this period, of this 24 hour period that they are now in. They have the sun has gone down. They've had the Passover feast. They're in that Jewish day period, which also happens to be the night, as we would call it and as Mark describes it in the words of Jesus. What does Jesus say then will happen? That the rooster will crow twice. Now that's probably a reference to the early morning, a period just prior to dawn. So Jesus says, so Peter... Though the others will be scattered in fear, you will repeatedly, three times, you will utterly repudiate and reject any association with me before the sun gets up in the morning. Before this night is out. Now it's possibly somewhere around midnight when this is said. That's a guess, but a lot of people say that because of how long the Passover feast normally went. It's possibly the case, but it's night. And it's only a matter of hours. It's not even 12 hours before the sun gets up because the sun has been down. They've had the Passover feast. There's been several hours gone already. They've come then away from that upper room. And as they're leaving the upper room, going towards the Garden of Gethsemane, that's when Jesus is interacting with Peter on this. Now, in the coming weeks, when we come to the last paragraph in this chapter, we will see, and as many of you know, Jesus' personal prediction of this with reference to Peter's denial and, the, and the, the rooster crowing and so on came to pass precisely as Jesus predicted. The fourth thing we need to look at as we come to verse 31 is the prevalent presumption. The prevalent presumption. You see, these words that Jesus says in answer to what Peter has just said, these solemn words in verse 30, it's like as if Jesus then, having said that, it provokes Peter uh, to have an even more intense reaction, a uh, response to what Jesus just said. We can say that because of how Mark introduces verse 31 before he quotes Peter, where it says, But he, Peter, spoke more vehemently, now that word vehemently has the idea not so much of increased volume but that he spoke with many words, a mass of verbiage. So he maybe had this argument, for, for this reason I won't, for this other reason I won't, for this reason I won't deny, for this I won't, I won't. He just went on and on and on, mass verbiage of why he wouldn't. It's not recorded all that he said but he, he, he keeps going on with this and the tense of the word in the original for spoke actually carries the idea of repetition with it anyway. A mass of verbiage flowed from Peter. Now, in his exuberant self-confidence, Peter was actually disputing the clear statements of Jesus, wasn't he? Like, he's arguing with Jesus. He's disputing what Jesus is saying. Well, you're saying that, but it's not right. Oh, yeah, 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 I heard you. You said that, but it's not right. He's disputing with Jesus. He's disputing the general statement that was backed up by Old Testament scripture. 
And now he's disputing the personal prediction about him that Jesus just said and introduced with the solemn assuredly. Hearing what Jesus had specifically been saying to him was about to happen soon is met by Peter with this real resistance. What does he say? Verse 31, If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Like, I would be willing to be a martyr. <laughs> Even then, I won't deny you. Well, obviously you don't know me. I would be willing to lay down my life with you or for you rather than deny you. Now, we must say that Peter's intention is commendable, isn't it? Like, it's a commendable intention. But it wasn't realistic because he didn't know his own heart. He presumed that he could stand for Christ. He presumed that he would stand with Christ even in the face of death. I'm not that weak, Lord. I'm strong. I would even die for you. But the reality was, when put in the midst of a fiery temptation, his so-called strength was shown up to be what it was. Weakness. Yet what Peter said was just an expression of his own thoughts. and It reveals where he was at when it comes to his own heart, but it wasn't just an expression of where he was at. The other ten were thinking the same. Isn't that what Mark tells us at the end of the verse? He says, And they all said likewise. Peter merely represented the others. As always, Peter was the spokesman for the group. And yet when it came down to it in the end, when push came to serve and he'd had his go, they each in turn not only thought the same thing, but they even said the same thing. That's what Mark says. He says, they all said likewise. Andrew, John, Thomas, Matthew, Philip, we go through them all. One by one, they all objected to what Jesus said. We will never, ever do that, Lord. So the point being, this was the presumptuous heart of all 11 disciples at this time. It was the prevalent presumption. It wasn't some exclusive thing just for Peter and the rest were okay. No, they are all got this same issue. It was presumption here. None of the eleven knew their own heart at that point. And yet within a couple of hours, Mark records over in verse 50, clearly he says, Then they all forsook him and fled. Despite their self-confidence as they walked to the garden on that Thursday evening, the sheep do scatter when the shepherd is taken. The strength that all the eleven claim to have in the heat of the battle is shown to be nothing but only weakness. You see, friends, here we have a portrait of weakness, not just of Peter, though Peter is at the fore of this, but they're all with this. They're all standing shoulder to shoulder with the same issue. They're all claiming strength, but it's a portrait of their weakness. We break now from the narrative at this point in the chapter and Lord willing pick up again Mark 14 next week. What lessons can we glean from this passage as we bring this to a conclusion? Well let me lay just two major points of application. There are many other things that could be said but things that, that God would surely have us see from this passage. The two fundamental lessons that arise out of these verses. Number one, the obvious thing. The folly of self-confidence. The folly of self-confidence. Peter could not believe that he could ever deny his Lord. Even if I should die with him, I would not deny him. It wasn't just impetuous Peter. But the whole time as he was speaking, the others are thinking the same thing. When given an opportunity, they all blurt out the same thing. They all said likewise. 
and by the end of this chapter, by the end of Mark chapter 14, all of them have the folly of their self-confidence exposed for us to see. Peter spoke not just for himself, he spoke for the entire band of disciples. But Christian friends, Peter blurted out not only what was in his heart, he blurted out not only what was in the heart of the eleven, Peter also speaks for us. His heart is our heart. Now perhaps many of us may not blurt it out, but residing within each of our hearts by nature is this same self-confidence. In addition to the pride lurking around in our hearts, like the remains even for us as Christians of our old sinful nature, not only have we got that issue, our world today, our culture today encourages self-confidence. It promotes it. It calls us to be self-assertive, to be confident. Have confidence in your own abilities, we're told. Believe in yourself, we're told. You may hear the comments. The sporting commentators talk about some certain players who performed well in a game. Why? Because they backed themselves. They believed in their ability. It's a common expression. It's, it's undergirded all of what's so common in our culture. And we may not be surprised to hear sports commentators speak that way. To, we not be surprised about this full of self-confidence that the world speaks about. That should not surprise us. But Christians ought to know what their own hearts are like. That we are not strong. We are not able to conquer the world in our own strength. J.C. Ryle says, what did all this confident boasting come to? He's asking the question about the eleven. What did all their, their, their confident boasting come to? He says, twelve hours did not pass before all the disciples forsook our Lord and fled. Their loud professions were all forgotten. The, the, the present danger swept all their promises clean away. So little do we know how we shall act in any particular position until we are placed in it. Let us learn to pray for humility, he says. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And then he has this very insightful sentence, short sentence, he says, there is far more wickedness in all our hearts than we know. Now we might not like to hit, hear that or think about that, but it's a truthful statement. There is far more wickedness in all our hearts than we know. We never can tell how far we might fall if once placed in temptation. There is no degree of sin into which the greatest saint may not run if he is not held up by the grace of God and if he does not watch and pray. The seed of every wickedness lie hidden in our hearts. They only need the convenient season to spring forth into a mischievous vitality. Let him who thinks he stands... Take heed, lest he fall. Proverbs 28, verse 26. He that trusts in his own heart is a fool. That's why I called it the folly of self-confidence. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Now, I don't think we have any reason to doubt the sincerity of Peter. Peter. I don't think we should. I don't think we should have any reason to doubt the sincerity of the other ten on that Thursday night. It's just that they didn't seem to understand at this point what their own hearts were capable of when away from the Master. As we will see in the next big paragraph from verse 32 and following, when we get there in the coming days, when they get into the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus goes to pray. What are the disciples doing? They're sleeping. You say, well, it's night. That's fair enough. But what had Jesus told them to do? 
Jesus clearly told them, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. And when the time of temptation came, because they hadn't been watching, because they hadn't been praying, when the time of temptation come, as strong as it was, they couldn't stand in their own strength, in their weakness, they ran away, they all fled, and in Peter's weakness, he did deny. We might sit here in the comfort and security of this building today, and in all sincerity, we, we can conclude in our minds, well, I would never deny my Lord. I would never fall into some gross sin and bring dishonour on Christ and his people. I would never do that. Friends, prior to any temptation, most of us are confident that we can resist. But... Once thrown into the midst of temptation, particularly ones with a strong satanic attack, every one of us would, will crumble in our weakness. What Peter went through, in particular Peter, what he went through was not some light affliction, was not some easy temptation he could just shrug off or push away. Luke records in the parallel passage to this, that Satan was intimately involved with this. Luke 22, 31, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Peter, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. And when such fiery temptations come our way, not one of us has the native strength within us to resist the devil. That injunction in James and in, and in Peter, particularly the one in James, to resist the devil is in the context of someone who is drawing near to God. You don't resist the devil in your strength. Do that, you'll foolishly fall. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. We sang earlier, put no confidence in man. Not just other people, we can do that, but ourselves. Put no confidence in man, in ourselves. The sooner we learn this lesson, the better. Learning it, though, not from bitter experience. We haven't got to go that way. Learning it from the scriptures. Learn it from this passage. That's why it's here. So that we might be spared the grief and the bitterness and the agony that Peter went through. The sooner we learn the lesson, the better. There is no wickedness. Nothing that you and I are not capable of doing when we are away from our master. You think of how far David fell and how long David had been walking with God. The man after God's own heart. Look at the horrible things he did. He was away from the Lord and down he went when temptation came. We must constantly watch and pray lest we too fall into temptation. One day when, when word came to a mature saint of how a minister of the gospel fell into gross moral sin which had the consequence of bringing horrible shame to the gospel and to the people of God. When the mature saint heard that news, when it was reported to him that seasoned Christian didn't say, oh, tut, tut. How can a Christian do that? How could a minister do that? That's not how he responded. The mature Christian didn't do it that way. After a period of silence, tears began to fill his eyes and spill over onto his cheeks. And he responded to the man who told him, he said, my brother, who knows but that I may be the next one. He was a man who didn't trust in his own heart. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. And that includes standing for Christ and resisting temptation, especially those strong ones. Don't back yourself to resist temptation. None of us can. The folly of self-confidence in Christ's disciples. But the second lesson I believe we get from this passage and it's tremendously positive and encouraging 
And it's this. The wonder of Christ's love and keeping power. The wonder of Christ's love and keeping power. Think of it. Jesus said to them, I will go before you to Galilee. Though I know that you are all going to forsake me. I know that's what's going to happen. But I'm going to go before you to Galilee. And though I know, Peter, you are going to deny me three times and you're going to curse and you're going to swear and you're going to be horrible in that situation, but still my love for you remains constant. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. John 13 and verse 1. Turn with me, please, to this last passage. To Luke 22. I quoted it before, but we need to come to this passage because this shows us a very positive aspect of the wonder of Christ's love and keeping power. Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Though, Peter, I know you will deny me. Though I understand that Satan is going to give you many fiery darts, I pray for you, Peter. I'll meet you in Galilee. Did you pick up when the angel gave that message in Mark 16? Tell the disciples and Peter. Highlight it. Tell Peter. I love Peter. Comes through even by the message of the angel. I'm bound to in cords of everlasting love, loving his own to the very end. Peter, here it is in verse 32. When you return, yes, you'll fall, but you're going to come back. When you return, strengthen your brethren. So I'm going to turn you, Peter, into what you are by nature, a denier. And by my grace, I'm going to turn you, by my spirit, I'm going to transform you, and you're going to go from a denier into a strengthener. And you're going to be of great help to your brethren because of what you've gone through. All of you. Jesus says, Though in your weakness you will run from me, by my grace I will strengthen you and you're going to be scattered again. But not in denial. You'll be scattered to the four winds in obedience because you'll go into all the world And you'll preach the gospel boldly to all nations. Even if you're martyred, I'll give the grace. You know, tradition tells us that it was only one out of the eleven who escaped being martyred for Christ. Ten of the eleven were martyred in the end. It was only the love and it was only the keeping power of Christ that could do that to the lives of these men we see in this passage. We see them in their native weakness. But by the end of their lives, by the Spirit of God and by the strength and the grace of God, they're bold to stand for him and to die for him. And the one that didn't die for him had persecution on the island of Patmos, according to Revelation chapter 1. Brethren, Here's the point of our confidence. It's Christ's love for us. Even though he knows what we do, even though he knows when we will fail him, O oh love that will not let me go. What a love is that? Though I might fail you, you will never fail me. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Christian friends, here is our confidence. It's the keeping power of Christ. 
His all-sufficient and sustaining grace. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1 verse 6. Hebrews 7.25 says, He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through Him. Why? Since He always lives to make intercession for them. The very ones that He is able to save to the uttermost, how can He do that? He has one who is interceding for those ones even now. I prayed for you, Peter. For you by name. You Individually, Peter, I have prayed for. Not one of the disciples for whom the Saviour intercedes for even today can fall to destruction. Think of this. It's a wonderful thought that Jesus prays now for every one of his followers. And that means if we, if we truly belong to Christ, none of Satan's attacks can finally overwhelm us. Even the most severe will ultimately fail. Now it's true, we may, we may tremble at the thought that, that, that we must wrestle against principalities and powers. But we need not fear because Jesus is praying for us. Do you think Jesus' prayers would be answered? Of course they're answered. And his prayers, his intercession is extremely specific. The word in Luke 22, verse 32 there, the word you, that, 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 that he says, Peter, I have prayed for you. That's the second singular word in the original. In other words, this was a personal prayer. I have prayed for you as an individual, Peter. I pray for you by name. Even now, your Saviour is praying for you personally that you may be kept not from temptation but kept through temptation. He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since for this reason he always lives to make intercession for them. So how can we in our lives Resist strong, satanic temptations? How can we stand for Christ in a hostile world? Well, this is our confidence. It's not ourselves. It's not looking deep within and try and find some inner strength and help. That's humanism. That's not Christianity. It's not believing in yourself. It's not Christianity. If you are truly the Lord's, and God even allows Satan to sift you. You have one who prays for you as an individual so that your faith will not fail. And though Satan might roam about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, 2, Peter, 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3 says, The Lord is faithful who will establish you and he will guard you from the evil one. So what is God saying to us from this passage today? It's only when you understand, it's only when you feel, when you sense your own weakness and you cast yourself fully upon me, God says, it's only then that you will know true strength. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. When I understand my true state of being utter weakness and I throw myself on him who is strong, it's then that I'm strong. The wonder of Christ's love and keeping power. I will go before you to Galilee. Jesus has gone before us to prepare a place for us. And he says, I will come again and I will receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Let's pray together, friends.